So this video isn't meant to support a particular political position or political party or even a specific issue that has been particularly divisive, such as you know, who can marry who or abortion or, or climate change or something like that. I simply want to point out some of the reasons that some of these discussions often stall at the outset. The reason is because a lot of people on both sides simply don't understand the meaning of the word tolerant. In other words, this is not a theological issue, it's a vocabulary issue. What does the word tolerance actually mean? And how does claiming that someone is being intolerant of your position align with the fundamental rules of logic? Perhaps an example will help us understand the misunderstanding regarding how many within society think about tolerance. For example, if my friend says blue is the best color and I say, you know what? I agree with you. I'm not actually being tolerant. Now, if he says blue is the best color and I say, no, it's definitely not the best color. Red is the best color, but I'll tolerate your, your position on, on, on which is the best color. Now I'm being tolerant. Here's the key, and here's what I need everybody to remember and learn and get if you don't get anything else from this video. Disagreement is a prerequisite for tolerance. If you oppose my view, which is to say that we hold mutually exclusive perspectives, tolerance does not mean that I should abandon my viewpoint and simply agree with you just to be nice. Likewise, you wanting or even forcing me to agree with you or with your perspective because you believe I should be more tolerant is actually you being intolerant. The word intolerance means not allowing alternative viewpoints to coexist with your viewpoint. Intolerance, not tolerant of things that I don't like or believe. What many people believe tolerance to be is actually intolerance. Tolerance means allowing alternative viewpoints to coexist with your viewpoint in spite of your disagreement with that perspective. I'll allow it. Now, to be honest, this concept should be English 101. So why is this such a big issue? Because when this misunderstanding regarding tolerance happens, or should I say continues to happen as it is happening, truth ceases to exist. If the metric for what is true becomes what the majority or any group views as the proper perspective that everyone should adopt or tolerate, then truth itself is sacrifice. Mob mentality has never proven to be the best measure for determining truth or morality. Man, what were we thinking? <laughs> Without truth, it would be impossible to sustain a singular standard or have a proper point of reference by which to position our understanding of truth. Not only should truth guide morality, but truth precedes meaning as well. Without knowing what's true, you can't arrive at an objective meaning for life. Truth and meaning are inextricably linked. And whether I or anyone likes it or not, whatever is objectively true does not cease to be true simply because we are uncomfortable with that truth or because we want to change that truth. So can we know truth? Is this even something we can determine? Let's see. George MacDonald said, to give truth to somebody who doesn't love it will only give them more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. Some people say they want the truth, but what they really want is to feel validated in what they already want to believe. There's a scripture from the Bible which says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth. People will find ways to co-sign what they already want to believe or already do believe. In this way, truth becomes secondary to personal desire. Now, whether you read or believe the Bible or whether you're a complete atheist, it doesn't really matter. I think it's pretty clear to everyone that people find those who tell them what they already want to believe. So we should ask ourselves, what standards do we use to test the loudest voices in our cultural, political, and theological silos, especially on the internet? The ultimate pursuit is truth, or at least it should be. Let's talk about how we can assess the truth of propositions and worldviews. First, there is the correspondence theory. Now here we're examining how particular statements correspond to reality. 
how well the individual assertions for a given claim correspond to the world around us. Next is the coherence theory of truth. So here we're assessing the entirety of the components in the propositions being put forth for their veracity. All of the subparts must provide a singular coherent understanding of the claim one is seeking to establish. The goal is to remove or at least reduce any undue allegiances to information which was acquired a priori. Now, a priori is a Latin phrase used to describe knowledge or information which was obtained prior to, prior, priori, or independent of observation or experience. Now, this may sound like something that we can just write off as useless, but we actually use it quite often, and when done properly, it isn't problematic. A tautology is a kind of repetitious statement that is necessarily true because of the way it's formed. For example, in a mathematical tautology, I could make the statement either A equals B, or A does not equal B. A better example might be if I said either the car is blue or the car is not blue. No matter what color the car is, the statement is true. Tautologies can sometimes help drive home the, the impact of the truth being communicated. Now, there's also a posteriori, which is knowledge obtained based upon empirical evidence and or experience. If information is obtained a posteriori, which contradicts our a priori understanding or possibly our bias, we should usually question our original understanding. If someone has a bias against the supernatural, but evidence for the supernatural is introduced, it would be prudent to change one's perspective. Another component involved in the trying to determine what's true is examining the logical consistency of the propositions being put forth. Are the statements logically consistent with reality with the perspective being put forth? I've done other videos specifically pertaining to how Christianity is logically consistent in ways that maybe some haven't considered. You can link to those later. But for now, I just want to establish if there are methods for arriving at truth. And I want you to simply think about do the conclusions on any issue make sense in light of the evidence. We should also consider is our understanding of our position empirically adequate. Now this one may be tricky at times because emotions tend to get involved, but is there any tangible evidence? Is there any historical, archaeological, scientific, philosophical, sociological evidence for the position that I'm affirming or holding to? And lastly, is my perspective experientially relevant? How do my experiences affirm or deny what is being presented? Once again, we should apply these standards with people we disagree with and with those with whom we agree. The current mindset of society violates one or sometimes all of these standards in what is presented as truth, often. The current mode of thinking is in line with something called pluralism, where all truths are allowed to exist even when they contradict each other. But truth, objective truth that is, by definition is singular. A quick story might help. I remember having the opportunity to teach and preach in Burundi, which is a small country in East Africa near Rwanda. And on that same journey, we did go to Rwanda and teach there as well. But in my sermon, uh, that one Sunday morning in Burundi, part of the sermon was actually about truth. And so I turned to my translator and I said, what is one plus one in your country? He said, two. I was like, man, that's crazy. Cause like back in Chicago, it's also two. <laughs> See, Objective truth has no boundaries. It is not bound to what you think about it or how you feel about it. If you say, well, I don't believe in gravity and then jump from a tall building, you'll believe in it pretty quickly. Truth is truth regardless of if you choose to or choose not to believe it. Often things exist through their opposites. We know what up is because we know what down is. We know what left is because we know what right is. Frank Turek says all truths exclude their opposites. He also said truth is discovered, not invented. It exists independent of anyone's knowledge of it. You know, for most of the history of the earth, people thought the earth was flat but that didn't make it true. In a more practical example, this means if you live in sin, but say you don't believe in hell, that's not gonna stop you from going. Please think wisely. The law of non-contradiction states that two opposing truths cannot both be true in the same time and space. Let's talk about one quick example. Hinduism is often represented as being the most tolerant and accepting of other faiths. That's just not true though. All Hindus believe in two fundamental uncompromising doctrines, the law of karma and the belief in the reincarnation. However, rejection of Hinduism led to the birth of Buddhism. Buddhism was born out of the rejection of two other very dogmatic claims of Hinduism. Buddha rejected the authority of the Vedas, which is the Hindu scriptures, and the caste system of Hinduism, which says based on your color, you are either a higher or lower class. Buddhism also does not tolerate some of the foundational views 
of Hinduism. However, most Buddhists are probably tolerant of Hindus themselves. You see how that works? Now, at this point, I'm not saying which one's true or false. I'm simply saying they can't both be true. A Buddhist would have to tolerate the beliefs and perspectives of a Hindu individual, and that would be fine, and we could move on. But the ideal situation is for truth to trump tolerance or intolerance. Truth over tolerance. It is possible, and I would argue necessary, as we seek to live together on this planet for us to find ways to truly tolerate those we disagree with, and when possible, to explain with love the reasons we have for disagreeing with whatever propositions or perspectives they are espousing. As an apologist, I regularly talk with people of a variety of worldviews. I've spoken with Hindu priests and Muslim imams and, and more atheists than I can count. But you know, I can probably count on one hand the amount of those conversations that have become contentious or argumentative. And I believe there's a couple reasons for this. First, they were all well-read. Even some of the young people, the, the teenagers that I've talked with, knew more than a lot of the Christians that I talked with about a variety of subjects from science to history to, to archaeology. Also, they had thought through the other potential worldviews. Number two, they were comfortable in the truth of what they believed, even if I didn't believe it also. Now, my sneaking suspicion is that I think a lot of people who are screaming about tolerance and intolerance are trying to shout down those that don't agree with them because deep down... Whether they admit it or not, they're not completely certain that they're correct. It's easier to make those that oppose them feel bad so that they don't have to actually engage in thoughtful and potentially position-defeating dialogue. Studies are clear that most people don't read books. Google and Wikipedia, and worst of all, your feelings, are not the most valid epistemological tools. Just to refresh, epistemology is the study of how we come to know what we know. I feel does not equal actually is. I heard does not equal this proposition is true. Also, as much as people claim they want tolerance as if that is the holy grail of human relationship and interaction, it's not. And that's not actually what they or anyone wants. The idea would be that those who we are in relationship would love us, not tolerate us. <laughs> if I say to my wife, oh, you know what? I just tolerate you so much. <laughs> and then on Valentine's Day, I, I get her a card expressing my undying tolerance for her. The rest of the the day ain't gonna be so good. Tolerance is actually a last resort in most cases, where we at least want to remain civil, but aren't willing to sacrifice our position. And that actually is a good thing. There are seven billion people on the planet and counting, and we aren't all going to agree. However, we do have to find a way to live together on this vast planet in harmony. I suppose this is why some people find a lot of Eastern spirituality to be attractive in the West, because it is built on a framework of connection and solidarity and tolerance and moral relativism. Largely because these beliefs teach you to focus inward, which means you don't have to deal with the ramifications of a relationship with a personal God. If we're told to love God and love others the same way God loves us, the burden is far greater than becoming one with the universe or searching inside yourself for some level of inner peace. Regardless of the fascination with those worldviews that some think are more tolerant, the reality we can all agree on is that intolerance, which is the proper name for the brand of tolerance, often being demanded today, has never benefited humanity. With regards to the Holocaust, Joel Spreckman notes, remember, it didn't start with gas chambers. It started with politicians who divided the people, us versus them. It started with intolerance and hate speech. When people stopped caring, became desensitized, and turned a blind eye, it became a slippery slope to genocide. It started with misguided ideas. Our thoughts are so important because they are the soil where ideas are nurtured. At the end of the day, it's better to know an uncomfortable truth than to live a comfortable lie. Uh -huh. We need to ask ourselves, is lying to someone better than tolerating their untrue belief? Is making someone feel comfortable and as though you tolerate their thought or idea a more worthwhile ethic than lovingly sharing the truth with them, even if they dismiss it or disagree with it? I suppose that's a decision everyone will have to make for themselves. But when making this all important decision, make sure and ask yourself if you're willing to die with the reputation of being tolerated, even if it means 
others die because you chose the idea of tolerance over the reality of truth. Peace. Thank you.